Well, shoot. Looks like no one put up your photo, Frida. Okay, when I said I was Frida, just now, that, that was a lie. And I apologize for doing that. No photo on an ofrenda, no crossing the bridge. You know what? I'm just gonna zip right over. You won't even know I'm gone. <laughs> Stop resisting arrest! Skeleton? More like felon. I'm just gonna zip right over. You wouldn't even know I'm gone! Within seconds of arriving to the land of the dead, Pixar's Coco lets us know that its version of the afterlife runs on very specific systems. Systems that permeate nearly every scene of the film and are initially used for everything from characterization and conflict to world building and comedy. Welcome back, amigos! Anything to declare? Uh, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> Hola. But as the film goes on, it'll slowly but surely demand two very contradictory things from its viewers. First, for them to clearly understand these systems and their consequences so they can empathize with one of its main characters and his motivations. Then to shrug them off as mostly background when they're no longer that relevant to the film's narrative. And it's this relationship the film has with the systems it's portraying that I want to explore. But to do that, I'm going to have to tackle Coco's World of the Dead as just a fantasy world like any other, instead of a fantasy world specifically inspired by Mexican culture. And I'm going to be doing that for a couple of reasons. Seeing as how I come from literally halfway across the world, it's basically impossible for me to be less of an authority on Mexican culture or Latino representation. There are way more qualified people who have written about this aspect of the film, and you can find all of that online. But the second and more significant reason is that the systems that play in Coco's world are a lot more universal than the Day of the Dead coding would have you believe. So I think distancing the film a bit from that cultural coding could actually help highlight the working parts underneath and bring to the forefront the fairly insidious implications that come up as a result. In creating the world of the dead, Coco makes use of one of the most ubiquitous world-building tropes in fiction, interpreting a fantastical setting in a way that directly reflects modern society. Doing this is at least as old as cinema, and if we're being honest, as old as storytelling. But modern animated films really like this trope. And Pixar specifically really, 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 really like it. As a quick side note, when you put all these films side by side, it makes sense that some patterns are going to come up, but it's kind of unsettling how one specific part of modern life keeps rearing its ugly head in the exact same way regardless of the verisimilitude of the interpretation. Ow! Careful! Careful! Don't speak. You can't do this! Why is he shooting at me? Why is he shooting at me? Guys! She <laughs> Please repel Please repel it! What is up with animated films and their obsession with portraying some form of police control? What does it say about us as a society that it's basically impossible to portray the modern world, even in the most abstract sense, without this coming up? No, like seriously, that wasn't rhetorical. I'm asking, what does it say about us? I'm not smart enough to draw any conclusions about this specific point without ending up in a fetal position on my bed depressingly watching old Vine compilations. Frisha, free, free shavakadu! <laughs> free shavakadu. Coco, though, stands out from all that company by choosing to portray a different part of modern life in the type of detail that most avoid. The world of the dead in Coco has class struggle and wealth inequality, it has border control and a screening process, its citizens have clear rights, and as is often the case, it's easier to pinpoint those rights specifically because there's a group that's excluded from them. No photo on an ofrenda, no crossing the bridge. The audience's vessel for said group, as well as most of the systems in this world, is Hector, the film's second main character who we're introduced to as he tries to trick his way into the most important right that his group has refused, crossing the border into the land of the living to visit one's relatives. Dumb flower bridge! You see, this society functions on two core principles. The photo on the ofrenda, which you can think of as state-sanctioned ID, and the offerings you receive by those who remember you, which basically act as wealth. So these two principles lead to a social and economic hierarchy that is also twofold. There's the binary of whether you have this ID or not, and thus whether you're eligible to a lot of the most basic rights. Then the no group is shoved off to the margins, and the yes group gets to experience the spectrum of a not-so-equal distribution of wealth. Where at the very top, we have the few who are overflowing with offerings. They leave me more offerings than I know what to do with. Below them, we have those who are getting by on the offerings they get from living family members. 
And at the very bottom, those in Hector's group, who have to scrounge up whatever they can, whenever they can, and often end up having to share with one another the little they do get. And by having such clearly defined groups that come up as a result of the systems around them, the portrayal of their experiences and the way these groups interact with each other end up being quite believable. Come on, stop pestering the celebrity! So while the scenes in the living world are more than happy to succumb to the ugly tendency of portraying working class struggle through an idyllic lens, look how happy he is! Just your plain, common, joyous... Victim of child labor. The world of the dead is less delusional. The people at the bottom are having no fun being at the bottom. Their economic status directly affects every aspect of their lives. Their clothing, their health, their living situation, their presence in public spaces, the way they're treated by other citizens, the way they're treated by authority figures, and all of that for the worse. You need to clean up your act, amigo. Whereas with the middle group, two interesting dynamics that tend to happen in our own world get reflected here as well, showing how the hierarchy also permeates their thinking. First, there's this constant hope of upward social mobility, as if there's always this lurking chance that the stars will align and move you up a couple of notches to your rightful spot. And the reason this idea is so pervasive in the film as in the real world is because in fact there is actual upward mobility, but only just enough to keep the illusion alive. If you really want to get to Ernesto, there is that music competition at the Plaza de la Cruz. Winner gets to play at his party. So if you exhibit talent in a way that's deemed worthy, or in our case, maybe go viral, if you have some sort of connection, an in of some kind, I need a favor. Or if you perchance prove to be particularly useful in some way, then yeah, there might be some mobility here, but otherwise don't count on it, because for the hierarchy to function the way it does, it runs on the core principle of the least possible mobility for the fewest possible people. <laughs> And this leads to the second dynamic, a delusional us versus them narrative. The way it goes is the us includes the middle group and those above, while the them are those below. Basically replicating a version of the binary split the systems around them already cause. The effect of this, of course, is dehumanizing the group at the bottom to such a degree where the middle group now only interacts with them in one of two ways, either by mocking them, Chorizo. Hey, it's Chorizo! Ah! <laughs> Very funny, guys. Or by pitying them. Aww, I don't know what I'd do if no one put up my photo. In reality, if the middle group took a moment to examine this narrative, which we all tell ourselves, they would realize that the us and them would pretty much be the inverse. Because not only is there no conceivable possibility that they ever get as many offerings as those at the top, but also all it would take is one mishap, say their photo being removed from the ofrenda. Sorry, senora, it says here no one put up your photo. Or, you know, a medical emergency, for them to basically be in the no binary, struggling to survive. Something those at the top don't have to deal with because it's implied that they aren't as reliant on a single ofrenda the way everyone else is. I'm on so many ofrendas it'll just overwhelm your blinky thingy. Now I do want to say that while the way the film portrayed the bottom group was intentional, I don't think these two dynamics I brought up about the middle group were. Instead, I think they were a byproduct of the film taking real life systems wholesale and just putting them in its world. Because while Coco isn't an allegory or a one-to-one -one parallel with some specific situation, like say Animal Farm, it is using specific real-world images and the systems attached to them to try and evoke very specific experiences. And by importing these images, they're also importing a whole lot of baggage with them. Because this isn't just characters vaguely being restricted from entering or leaving an area, it's a screening process that determines who gets through based on relatively arbitrary rules that are beyond the individual's control. And this isn't just characters vaguely down on their luck, it's systemic wealth inequality that is a direct result of many of the same seemingly arbitrary rules. We're all the ones with no photos or friends, no family to go home to, nearly forgotten, you know? The film has taken clear inspiration from the real world to make these well-defined systems, the requirements of which inherently favor a portion of the population and disadvantage another, and the consequences of which just enlarge the gap between the groups. And what does it do with all that? Well, not that much. Though the systems technically permeate the entire film, their relevance are mostly front-loaded for setup. Their consequences are used as characterization for Hector, and their rules are used as an excuse for the conflict and its MacGuffins. After that, they're pushed off to the side to focus on the twists and turns of the story before they come back real quick for the big, and in the end, everything was all right moment when Hector gets through the border and crosses the bridge. And look, as far as priorities go, focusing on the character drama at the center of your film makes sense. Especially when it's going to culminate in a scene that is so good, it single-handedly elevates the film. 
But the fact that the film decides not to engage with the systems or all of that baggage in any real way after leaning so heavily on them for characterization and setup is not just disappointing, it's straight up insidious. Because while the film doesn't do all that much with the systems, it does end up saying quite a bit about them. I mean, did you notice what I said back there? Before they come back real quick for the big, and in the end, everything was all right moment when Hector gets through the border and crosses the bridge. Hector still has to get screened to cross the border at the end of the film. In Coco, we're introduced to an entire section of the population that is pushed off to the side, placed in slums, and basically left to die a slow and painful death. And at the end of the film, the systems that exemplify that marginalization are all still in place. And that group presumably still exists in the exact same way, and are still being left to die in the slums. Coco tells a story with a happily ever after ending, where nothing fundamentally changes. It doesn't feel that morbid initially because when you're watching the film, it's pretty easy to get swept up in the feel-good narrative. That no one outside of our core cast of characters is affected in any way doesn't really click at first. And a big reason for that is that the film builds on its ideas in such a pernicious way that you don't quite realize what you're being fed until you've already swallowed. Take your drink. Okay, you okay? <laughs> to see what I mean, we could take a quick look at wreck -It Ralph. There's a similar scene in the beginning of the film where Ralph is discriminated against at a border crossing. Step aside, sir. Random security check. Random, I'm behind. You always stop me. Much like in Coco, this is used as a key moment of characterization to show us the strain the system puts on a specific group. In this case, video game villains. Anything to declare. I hate you. I get that a lot. So if we put these side by side and compare how each story builds on its own scene, we notice a key difference. In Wreck-It Ralph, this is unjust. In Coco, this is unfortunate. The people around Ralph go through as much change as he does in the film. The way he's treated at the end is drastically different from the way he's treated in the beginning. There's no room for you up here. And an important point here is that as far as the system is concerned, his situation and role haven't changed. He's the same video game villain at the end that he was in the beginning. So for this to happen, those around him had to actively change. You don't know what it's like to be rejected and treated like a criminal. Yes, I do. That's every day of my life. It is? He was never the problem. The way he was classified and treated was the problem. The film also manages on top of all this to deal with its homelessness crisis, which is always a plus. In Coco, almost the exact opposite happens. The only reason Hector is treated differently by the end is because his situation has significantly changed in the eyes of the system. I mean, look at that. She's all but ready to shut him down because she's under the assumption that he's still in the no binary. But instead, his photo is on the ofrenda and he now has that state sanctioned ID, so he gets through. The wrong here isn't the system that's placed countless people in the situation, it's the specific series of events that put Hector among them. You're being forgotten. And whose fault is that? It's Ernesto and what he did. The problem is this singular bad actor who abused the system and not that the system is inherently ripe for abuse. Nor that it marginalizes people based on an arbitrary requirement that automatically puts certain folk at a disadvantage. And look, I'm aware that a happily ever after ending where the only change is that a baddie at the top is no longer there is a widespread narrative trope, both in fiction and depressingly in the real world. Hey there, I just wanted to let you know that Replacing him with a hollowed out embodiment of the system that let them getting elected won't solve the problem. And you ain't black. Ugh. One of the ways the film gets away with this bullshit of siphoning all of Hector's problems solely through Ernesto and not having anything else change is by underlying it with another concept. That being that all of this is just the natural law of the afterlife in this world. The systems we see are beyond control and therefore beyond change. And that's that. Hey, it happens to everyone eventually. Now, you might notice that correlating a supernatural and unchangeable law with our current economic and social systems, which are both very man-made and very changeable, is kind of fucked up, to say the least. And something I'd almost call genius propaganda word intentional, which, for the record, I don't think it was. 
It also brings up the question of why even use the modern elements and draw such a screwed up correlation? As others have pointed out, the border control isn't necessary. Hector can't get through no matter what. The bridge won't let him because of the magic or whatever. So if it's unnecessary and it's not going to be explored in the story, why bring in these pretty accurate portrayals of border control and poverty instead of leaning into a more magical and myth-like tone as some other films have done? The kind answer would be that Pixar thought including the modern elements and riffing on them would be fun, as they've done so many times before. The more cynical answer would be that they thought having one of the main characters in their Mexican-inspired film struggle with crossing a border would constitute as some vague commentary and win them brownie points with critics. Which it did. Whoops, had that again there. Either answer though doesn't really shed light on why it plays out in such a tone-deaf way. Can you imagine if Wreck-It Ralph ended with its typical montage of positivity but in one of the vignettes he stopped again for a random check and he just smiles at the guy like, oh you, and then he pets a homeless Qbert on the way back to his game? Hang in there guys. I don't know, maybe you can since that's like basically what happens at the end of Coco, a film that made an even bigger point about the negative consequences of its system than Ralph did. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying that Wreck-It Ralph is the height of social commentary in fiction. In the end, both films were designed to pass the least problematic, most milquetoast message to achieve the ultimate goal for their corporate overlords. Nor am I saying that stories that decide to portray unjust systems have to end with those systems being toppled. Of course not. Stories need to have the room to play out in whatever way fits them best. But if part of the point you're making is how fucked up these systems are, then you can't just end the story by completely ignoring that point like Coco does. And it's not like they were limited for options of what to do. They can end with a depressing message that systems like that will ultimately overwhelm any individual who tries to question it. Or they can give it a dark satirical touch to highlight that specific people actually benefit from these unjust systems. Griffin, please, can we talk about Bonnie, it? Bonnie, you'll land on your feet, I know it. They can also keep either one of those darker tones, but swing it a bit more to the hopeful side by having their characters realize that the only way to fight back is by organizing. So they end up fulfilling their small role as part of a bigger movement. In fact, even if we stick to animated films, since they often deal with different expectations than their live-action counterparts, they still have a fair bit of room to work with. Take Zarafa, for example. A film that tells the fictionalized story of the first giraffe that was ever transported to Europe. A film that also decides to include no less than slavery in that story, making it so clearly a point as to open with it. Doucement. Pas trop la marchandise. And like in Coco, at the end, the main characters are able to get out of their situation, the slaver in their specific story gets his due, and the film ends on a happier note, even though slavery presumably still exists. But if we take a moment to explore how Zarafa engages with its ideas, we notice that the dissonance in its ending is kind of the point, because the characters actually failed their mission. The entire reason for the trip in the first place was that Alexandria was under siege by the Turks. So the Basha thought if he sent a giraffe as a gift, the king of France might help him. In the end, he doesn't. Eh bien, Monsieur Hassan, retournez dire à votre Pacha que la France a autre chose à faire qu'à combattre les Turcs. And the main character's goal is that he wants to keep the promise he made to the giraffe's mom that he take her back home to Africa. In the end, he can't. In fact, the specific reason he fails is because in the time he was trapped as a slave in France, she grew too big to fit in the carriage anymore and he has to learn that these unjust systems can result in direct and irreparable consequences to individuals. But that when one fails, the best thing they can do is to keep their head up, adapt, and still try to change the world around them for the better, to the best of their ability. And despite some pretty big tonal problems and a couple of scenes in the middle of the film, the story does a pretty good job of maintaining that idea throughout the runtime. All of the main characters have clear principles when it comes to these systems and are able to affect the people around them in direct ways. But conversely, those in power are for the most part beyond their reach. Votre Altesse, cet homme que vous appelez notre sauveur, c'est un esclavagiste qui trafique avec des pilleurs de tombes. The amiable Basha ultimately has priorities that don't include dealing with any of these systems. Yekfe Hassan, tu me parles d'un bateau. Moi, je te parle d'une ville, Alexandrie la Grande. Sauf votre respect, votre Altesse. On ne joue pas avec la vie des hommes. And the shit-tastic king of France is so out of touch with anybody's reality but his own that all he really does is perpetuate nearly every problem the film brings up. Veuillez, je vous prie, vérifier que la cage des singes est bien fermée. J'en vois un qui s'est échappé. <laughs> je suis pas un singe. C'est vous le fou. So even though these unjust systems seem unlikely to change anytime soon, Maki is able to metaphorically reverse the situation and push ahead. The story starts with his village being burned to the ground and his lineage basically being wiped off the map, abhorrent actions with irreversible consequences, but it ends with him founding a new village and ensuring that his culture lives on in some form. 
Then again, modern French films seem to be particularly good at finding that balance of ending on a hopeful note for their characters while not trivializing the real world issues in their stories. And I focused here on examples where the unjust systems remain at the end of the films because, as we've discussed, that's what happens in Coco. Which is odd when you think about it because it otherwise fits quite easily alongside other animated films from Hollywood in the way it wraps up its story. As we know, these mainstream animated films almost universally end with an ideal, or some version of an ideal. In Monsters Inc., they completely revamp their energy system from something that scares kids to something that brings them joy, unless you consider bad stand-up scary. In Ratatouille, the critic changes his ways and they open a brand new restaurant in Paris where humans and rats can coexist. In Wally, -E, the entirety of the fucking human race returns to a post-apocalyptic Earth to restart civilization. Making a big and often near unbelievable leap of logic between the moment we fade out from the climax and the moment we fade into the conclusion is a common technique in these films. You can imagine what happened next. And Coco does it as well. We fade to a year later, and the biggest musical artist in the history of Mexico is cancelled at the drop of a hat, Hector is recognized for his musical genius, and Miguel's family, who for generations have based their entire identity on the sole fact that they forbid music, have done a complete 180 on their stance because the dead matriarch in a scene none of them were around for told Miguel that she no longer hates music. And I'm not pointing these out to criticize them. These leaps of logic have become established staples of the medium, and they kind of make these films our modern day fables. But they also show us that there's very little that limits how far the filmmakers push their conclusions. These endings often ask us to let our imaginations run wild, to put our pessimism aside and to dream big so we can take these leaps and see the best outcome, the best version of how these stories can play out. So when the border control remains at the end of the movie, that is a choice by the filmmakers that is distinctly separate from a desire of wanting to maintain the integrity or logic of their setting, something none of the other films seem to struggle with. It makes you wonder how it remained in the film. Like, did it not come up as a red flag in any of their story meetings? I would be shocked if it didn't, given Pixar's work ethic and the iterative process of how they write these stories. But then, what does that imply? Was it a deliberate choice to leave it in? It was either that, or an oversight. And to be honest, I'm not sure which is worse. And to a certain degree, it doesn't matter, because both of them end up giving us the same thing. A weak middle ground that doesn't tackle the bittersweetness of giving its characters a happy ending in a world where countless others are still struggling with the problems that affected them, nor a happily ever after that presents some core change to the systems in its world. On top of this, it also manages to miss the one thing that the two endings do have in common. The fact that they both understand that the systems in their stories are inherently unjust. There is no version of Zarafa as it is where any of the characters we're supposed to relate to just shrug slavery off. And there is no version of Monsters Inc. as it is where Sully goes back to scaring kids after he sees the direct effect it has on Boo. And look, it's clear that the film sees the consequences of the systems in its world as bad for those who suffer from it. There's no denying that. It milks the shit out of that suffering. But since it never fully commits to how inherently unjust the systems are, Coco ends up becoming the film equivalent of I don't know what I'd do if no one put up my photo. A detached and ultimately meaningless pity that at best serves to make the viewer feel good for recognizing that thing bad? And at worst continues to normalize a very harmful system. Because let's get one thing straight, it is a harmful system. And unjust too. And by doing that, by appropriating real world struggles with a specific system for characterization and conflict, and then trying to pass off an ending where the system is completely unchanged, where the characters still have to worry about the possibility of being marginalized, and where officials are all but ready to push them off to the edges, as an ideal happily ever after, Coco betrays an underlying misunderstanding of, and a foundational disconnect with, the very struggles it's appropriating. <laughs> So what is the system that Coco is using as a basis for its own? Well, simply put, our border system. Specifically that which limits or provides access to the freedom of movement across borders based on a couple of factors. 
primarily the country your passport says you're from. And it's important to emphasize that last point because the requirements for this access can vary drastically depending on your passport. Like, it's not even close. If you come from a first world country, then the majority of the places you're probably going to go to in your life have basically no requirements. You just have to show up with a valid passport and you'll get stamped through. This idea of just showing up with a valid passport is nothing more than a fantasy for the rest of the world. Remember when I said I came from halfway across the world in the beginning? That wasn't just an excuse for not discussing the Mexican context of the film. It's actually quite relevant to what I want to say here. And that's called foreshadowing, motherfucker. motherfucker. Think of it as a Chekhov's gun that I planted in the first act and now we're in the third, so I have to do whatever it is you do with a Chekhov's gun in the third act. You see, for those of you who come from first world countries, let me put it into some perspective. It's basically impossible for us, those who come from third world countries, to go almost anywhere, even for a short period of time, without explicit approval beforehand in the form of a visa. Exit visa? Oh, exit visa? Oh. No ticket! Oh. One of the main myths that the film subtly perpetuates, and that more people than I expected from first world countries kind of low-key believe, is that at its core, the system requires the same thing from everyone. No photo on an ofrenda, no crossing the bridge. Which just isn't the case. Now, yes, we did mention a bit that even though the requirement in the film was technically the same for everyone, it inherently puts certain people at an advantage and others at a disadvantage. And we'll talk about the direct connection between an individual's wealth and how the system affects them in a bit. And yes, people from first world countries sometimes need visas as well to go to specific places, but that experience is often streamlined to such a degree as to not even be comparable. For us, the mere task of applying for a visa is an arduous, mind-bogglingly dumb experience that often consists of a series of convoluted demands that are worthy of any fetch quest that's ever been designed to pad out an RPG's length. Bank statements for every account you have going back years, a signed document from your employer proving that you do in fact work for them, and or ensuring that you're coming back and that when you do, they'll still want to employ you. A detailed itinerary of what you plan to do every day you're in the country you want to visit. Some random fucking official document you've never heard of from some random fucking governmental body that's only open three days a week, stamped by some random fucking government employee who only comes in one of those three days. To name a few. And of course, which of these is or isn't required in your specific application depends on the country you want to go to, as well as the country you happen to be in while applying. So, it's basically procedurally generated bureaucratic nonsense designed to, well, make you question your value as a human being. And we haven't even mentioned the fact that this is all accompanied by a not-too-small, non-refundable fee and often includes an interview with some indifferent employee at the embassy, or the private firm the embassy hired, who it often seems gets the final say on whether or not you get that visa, because is it even necessary to say at this point that refusals are pretty common? Mr. Singh, I considered your application today, but I'm not satisfied that you meet the requirements of the rules this time, um, so I'm going to refuse your application. Do you understand? Yes. Even skipping over the fact that these requirements in and of themselves automatically exclude portions of the population, the mere task of going through the experience can often play out in pretty heartbreaking ways. Like, there's this lady who works behind the desk at the small gym in my neighborhood, who's in her late 50s or early 60s, and one day a while back, I walked in and saw that she had done up her hair and was wearing full makeup, so I commented on how nice her new hairstyle looked. She told me she'd just got done with an interview at the Spanish embassy that morning. Her son works in Barcelona and she was hoping to visit him for the holidays. She explained that she hadn't seen him in god knows how long, since she'd already been refused a visa in the past on two different occasions. So she thought fixing herself up that day would hopefully give a better impression at the interview. She told me that this time, she did a pretty good job of presenting herself in the way she knew she was, in the way her application couldn't. And I think it's nice that she felt that way, that she was able to get something out of the experience, because, needless to say, she was refused a third time. But let's assume you're lucky. You get the visa and all goes well. You can now look forward to the always pleasant experience of getting through passport control armed with the knowledge that, unlike at the end of Coco, finally getting the right papers guarantees nothing and that the passport that currently houses that visa will almost always ensure that you're greeted with some level of suspicion. You know how the whole tension at the end of Inception hinged on whether he would actually get through passport control or not? I promise you I've gone through that exact tension every time I've walked up to passport control. Handing an official a third world passport can often feel like the equivalent of telling them, hey, by the way, the system considers me a second rate human and you can legally treat me like garbage. Over the years, I've become acutely sensitive to this dynamic because of a particularly layered situation I'm in. You see, I sound like, well, like this, and you can't see me, but I pass for white, which means that in my day-to-day -day life, the majority of the people I meet tend to assume I'm white and from the West. 
As a result, it's not unusual for me to automatically get social privileges often reserved for white foreigners. So I'm treated with kindness and respect and people just assume I'm honest and nice and trustworthy and to tell you the truth, I am none of those things. Not a one, like not even partially. The amount of bullshit I've done in my life could absolutely have filled up the script for this entire- And since I've been lucky to travel quite a bit, in a restricted fashion but quite a bit nonetheless, I've been put in a position over and over again to see the contrast between how I'm treated when officials assume I'm white and how I'm treated after that assumption is cleared up. And it basically comes down to this insane whiplash of going from undeservingly being treated like I can do no wrong to undeservingly being treated like I can only do wrong. The high cost of the ticket, the small amount of luggage, and the woman's odd behavior all tell the agents they could be dealing with a drug mule. Or they may be dealing with a very tired passenger who just got off an 11 hour flight from Honduras to Spain and is currently flummoxed because airport officials are interrogating her on every tiny detail and have just revealed to her that the predatory travel agency she probably bought that ticket from ripped her off by a whole lot, all while a production crew sticks a fucking camera on her face and films the entire thing. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. Anyway. Anytime I'm put in a situation where my passport is relevant, I just hold my breath, tense up, and hope that this unknowable wave of suspicion that's gonna hit me doesn't wipe me out in the process. And this leads to situations where even the most unremarkable interactions are fucking tense as shit. Like the first time I went to the UK, I landed in Gatwick Airport, and the guy at passport control looked through my passport for like 5 minutes, then without telling me anything, got up and walked over to this other guy who I assume was his higher up because he was walking along the counters. And then they just talked over my passport for like 10 minutes, glancing at me every few seconds. And I couldn't hear what they were saying, so I would just smile every time they looked at me, trying to look as nonchalant as possible. But in my mind, I was slowly going mad. I was just like, I'm going to get arrested, aren't I? This is it. This is what it's all come to. I began to remember all the stories I've heard of people being stopped at airports for no justifiable reason, which somehow then led me to start quietly compiling a list of every sin I've ever committed in my life, trying to pinpoint the exact moment of when it all went wrong. You know, for the autobiography I'm probably going to be writing while I'm in jail. But then he came back and nothing happened. He stamped the visa and off I went. Basically the same person I was when I stepped up to his counter, except now with a detailed list of all my sins neatly stored in the back of my mind and an extra 15 minutes of self-loathing and stress to add to my then net total. And automatic suspicion like this by officials is so common that I know I should have already come to terms with the fact that this is just my reality, but I can't. By the time you get to passport control, you've had to juggle and bounce so much nonsense that you're just waiting for it all to topple over. And when it doesn't and you somehow get through, I don't know. I don't think I've ever felt joy crossing a border. Just relief. Relief that somehow nothing went wrong. Or bitterness. I've definitely felt bitterness before. Like I know the suspicion ultimately has nothing to do with whether I have the appropriate visa or not, but it's difficult not to get bitter when it's so fucking blatant. Clearly he hasn't done the exam because he can't talk about it. Not that I'm a prejudging, of course. I remember a time I was crossing a land border in the Caucasus with three friends from France. We were obviously all in the same group because our backpacking gear made us stand out. They all went before me and the border official smiled at them, snapped their passports, and they crossed. When I handed him mine, his demeanor suddenly changed, which was a given. He probably thought I was also French. So he inspected my passport. Then he continued to inspect my passport. He turned to the page of my visa, which no one else in the group needed, by the way, then went back to the first page and, I shit you not, pulled out one of those, like, diamond inspector things and proceeded to methodically go through every single page of my passport one by one, checking the stitching that held the pages together. I remember glancing at my friends, who at this point had been standing there for nearly 20 minutes just waiting for me to cross to their side, then looking back at the official, who was still completely entranced by the details of my passport, and thinking, the first three people in this group all had one of the most coveted passports on the planet. And the one you think is forged is the piece of shit I carry? For people from first world countries, a lot of travel stories of this sort sound like regular bureaucratic inconveniences because to them, that's all they are. But to folks from the third world, it's impossible to look at the situation as anything but systemic. When the difficulty of the most basic tasks is directly tied to the name of the fucking country on the front of your passport and there are entire industries dedicated to ranking said difficulty, you become disillusioned real quick. Can I just say something? Sure. I think it's really wrong that your airport de detains people who are mostly colored and people who look different. Listen, let me explain to you why that might be the case and why you might see it like that, okay? The reason being that any of these people are here is because we have an immigration issue with them. 
<laughs> Remember that woman from Honduras? Let's catch up with her for a minute. So they go through all her stuff, they interrogate her, they do a body search, they x-ray her, and when they can't find anything wrong in her possession, they drug test her to see if she's on something. And though she's clearly bewildered by the whole thing, she cooperates completely. But when they get the results... And when all of that comes back negative and everything checks out, what do they do? They hand her over to the national police for further investigation. They hand her over to the police! My God! This poor woman probably spent a chunk of her savings on this overpriced three-day trip to Madrid, and she's going to spend at least a third of it being interrogated by officials because of her passport and suspicious behavior. And all these stories are just about visiting a place. It's so much worse if you wanted to move. The process can get much more convoluted. Also, if you haven't guessed by now, wealthy individuals are mostly unaffected by the system. Ignore the fact that a large portion of the wealthiest people in third world countries are directly involved in politics and completely skip this system with diplomatic passports or opportune connections, the rest just buy their way out of it. Investing in another country, say moving your company or opening a new one, will either just plainly get you another passport or put you pretty far in the stages of getting another one. Actually, it doesn't even have to get that complicated. Just buy a summer home in Spain or Greece and you're good to go. This is so prevalent that honestly I'm more confident in the fact that any wealthy person in a third world country has a second more convenient passport than I am in the knowledge of whether or not I'm going to have a normal bowel movement tonight. It goes without saying that these options are well beyond the reach of regular folk who have entirely different legal channels to maybe achieve the same thing. With a governmental body, they can go into debt to go through a humiliating and expensive legal process that often takes years and more often just leaves them in limbo, or they can sign a predatory contract with an international company that'll keep them trapped in another country away from their families working nightmare jobs for slave wages. If neither of these sound particularly attractive, they have the option of remaining in their countries where they can sit at home, stare at their college degrees, and rot in an economy that's too busy trying to pay off its debt to the IMF and World Bank. Or perhaps work in a factory earning less than $2 a day making the t-shirt you're currently wearing. So then, is it any surprise that people often resort to dangerous alternatives, which if they get lucky enough to survive, they're then lambasted for and treated like criminals? I guess they should have just bought that summer home in Spain. Honestly, I could go on and on about this for quite a bit longer because there is a lot here and it's all fucked up. Like, we haven't even talked about how these systems are affected by capitalism and colonialism, both the historic version which created them and the current version which perpetuates them. Or the fact that the modern iteration of the passport and border control is only about 100 years old and was initially instated as a temporary post-war measure, but then just was never dismantled again. Or even about how everything I've told you so far in this part of the video, though honest and true for me, is still coming from a relatively privileged place, because while it is a nightmare to have a third world passport today, the people who are absolutely fucked over by these systems are those who are stateless or refugees, those living on occupied land or territories, like every day is a human rights violation for them. But I've decided not to go into any of that, beyond the quick mentions just now, because I realized, one, I've already gone on about this for far too long in a piece that is, if you remember, about Coco. Two, though these topics are very important, they're not strictly relevant to the point I'm making in this dumb video. And three, it would just add so much to the stress I'm already feeling about this section, and I'd almost definitely end up spending even more days curled up in a fetal position on my bed despondently watching old Vine compilations. Look at all those chickens! And if I'm honest, I think I've reached my quota of those days for the year. So, with all that said, do I think that Coco is about all of this bullshit? No, of course not. It's about family and remembrance and all that lovely stuff. But it does lean on very specific images to evoke very specific experiences. Like I mentioned, this isn't a vague restriction from entering or leaving an area. It's characters who are nervous and agitated as they're being screened at a border control for a relatively arbitrary set of requirements that are beyond their controls. And now that we've gone through some of the real world context around these systems- Oh my god, will you look at all that baggage in the background? This is where I feel I need to re-emphasize that I'm not saying stuff like this shouldn't be used in stories, but rather that they should be used carefully. And if the film is going to rely so heavily on these experiences to characterize Hector's struggles, then I don't think it's a lot to ask it to engage with them as well. In its decision to instead quietly push them to the background in its second half, 
Coco ends up becoming a remarkably telling case study on how easy it is to normalize oppressive systems when you wrap them up in feel-good stories. Particularly those that might present themselves as underdog stories of individuals struggling with the exact same systems they end up normalizing. It's in much of the feel-good narratives that surround us, both fiction and non-fiction. A success story here of someone who was a refugee and now is a celebrity, a profile piece there of someone who grew up in the slums only to become rich later in life. Much like with Hector, the images and experiences of these struggles are primarily used for characterization and setup, something that's incredibly effective at getting us invested because who doesn't like a good underdog story? Especially one where a minority group might actually get some representation. But of course, the sleight of hand here is that we feel like we've engaged in a critical look of the systems we're being presented with, when in reality, we haven't done that at all. All we've done is get so caught up in the feel-good narrative of someone getting through the cracks of the system that we forgot to take a step back and ask the important question of why the system still is what it is. It's an insidious dynamic, and it's incredibly effective, because in our seemingly overly self-aware era, the viewer can now feel good for feeling bad about a shitty system, despite the fact that the happily ever after ending they just saw doesn't even indulge in a fundamental change of that system but instead focuses on the compromise of lifting a single individual out of their specific, unfortunate situation. Enjoy your visit, Hector. Enjoy your visit, Hector. Enjoy your visit, Hector.